I've been coming to ABRF since 1998, and one of the things I've really appreciated is, over the years, learning from my colleagues uh, how they're using different technologies and uh, getting to hear a little bit about what kind of applications work in their core facilities and this sort of thing. So hopefully you can uh, get something like that out of this today. I don't know everything about the, you know, I'm not going to be able to tell you everything, but you've got tremendous resources here with the LT team, or Thermo Fisher team, and so you can go to them if, you know, I'm not able to answer your questions. But, um, and the other thing too is I've been uh, doing real-time PCR since 1996 when we got our first 7700 machine. So uh, another application for TACMAN um, in the digital PCR has been really exciting, I think. Okay, so simply why and how. Um, at Penn State, we've been really good at bringing in new technologies for the researcher, and uh, we, you know, I feel like the researchers need the best technology, and it's kind of nice if the core brings it in, because then they can um, kind of vet it and also um, uh, develop practices so they can get their best results. So when you consult with them, you know what you can tell them what you need from them. And uh, the digital PCR, in this case, is a prime example of what we can do for the uh, the uh, researcher. Uh, we can introduce it as a service, and that's probably what we'll start as, and a, a small charge for that, and later maybe make it something where people can walk in and um, use it on their own. Uh, as you might know, if you've looked at digital PCR, um, there are several applications, and uh, you can have, look at pathogens or low targets, um, low level or low fold gene expression, rare alleles, or copy number variation. Uh, we've basically started with pathogens or low targets, and uh, you know we, we uh, hopefully can move into some of these other areas as well. And uh, by what we've done is pick a few people that we know are already doing some uh, real-time PCR that might uh, be in this type of application, and uh, we're doing free things for them, so that we can use those as examples to um, show to other researchers, and they can um, you know get excited about it too. Okay, so in the project design is very simple. I mean, a lot of you, if you're doing real-time PCR, you can't. You already have a valid TACMAN assay, and um, hopefully, you know, high efficiency TACMAN assay. And all you need then is cDNA or DNA. And of course, uh, like I say, the LT team or the Thermo Fisher team can uh, give you more information about how um, inhibitors aren't as much of a problem and some other details about preparing your samples. So the first, pa first pathogen I'm going to talk about has to do with Elm disease at Penn State, or Elm, Elm disease in general. And here's a picture of Elms on the um, uh, uh, Old Main Lawn, Marsha Fisher, Marsha Slater. I know. Marsha Slater is an alum of Penn State, and uh, she knows a lot about the, the Elms. But the Elms have traditionally been a very beautiful tree, uh, tall and kind of almost like vase-like. However, they've uh, suffered some severe blows over the years. The first was Dutch elm, which came in the 20s from uh, Europe, and it was a fungi which blocks xylem. Uh, Penn State's elms survived this, but then elm yellows came along, and that's pretty much the death knell. Cornell's lost, I think, all of their elms. Penn State has, they were cutting them down and replacing them with just the Dutch elm, but now it's not even, not even replacing them more. But it's a bacteria without cell walls. It disrupts regular growth. So about five or six years ago, I helped develop um, a, uh, an assay for elm yellows, and we were, um, the researcher would use that to uh, determine whether an elm on campus had the elm yellows and then try to determine what to do about it, whether to cut it down or what. So we had a valid assay already, and so then we just moved into the d digital PCR world and uh, tried one sample. And this is a, this shows one of the views of the software. And so um, let me back up and just give you a very short workflow. And that is um, you prepare a reaction, a 15 microliter reaction in a, in a tube. That is put onto a ch the chip, which we first did manually. Now we have the autoloader. But uh, my technician became very good at the manual. And I hear Peter is as well. So um, you put it on there, and then you use a flatbed module for the 9700 to run the reaction. After that, you can put it in a reader and uh, then transfer the data to a, a flash drive, put it in your regular computer, and it uses the software. Um, you go to the uh, live technology site, 
upload your data, it does all the, soft, all the analysis for you, and you can look at different screenshots to, to evaluate your data and analyze it. And this is one of the evaluations um, uh, views, and this is what the chip looks like, and the yellow is actually the rocks, which is included in all the, uh, AB, uh, the master mixes, and so any well that got master mix will show as yellow. Now, if, you, uh, if that well is also has a piece of template DNA, then that will be in the wells uh, also. If the um, template DNA um, amplifies, which it should, because you've got a good assay, then you're going to see FAM, in this case, the blue. So um, this basically shows that it's a fairly good uh, dilution. The second one has a little bit less in it, I think about half. And you can also see um, the separation of the background and the fan peaks there. Uh, you want to well, get about 16,000 wells out of 20,000 to, uh, um, to get a good high, get better precision. And we usually get 16 to 18,000, sometimes a little less than that. So, like I said, these were two different dilutions, and actually the sample ended up doing four different um, dilutions, and uh, the uh, software will give you copies per microliter right away. It also gives a precision, and you'd like to be below 2%, but what you can do is put all, these, all the data into one, and you're going to get, again, a copy number, oops, as well as precision, which is less than 2%, sorry. Um, and then you can determine total copy numbers in that uh, sample that you got, and it's 2,600, whatever, here. So um, we were very happy with uh, that first test, and we went ahead and looked at their other samples, which um, these, most of these were very low responders, and so you're talking about CTs in the 30s, which anybody knows you really can't uh, know, you know the differences when you're working with that. But with the digital PCR, it made it a little more simpler to uh, determine that there are differences between these. So the first run, I either did one or two chips, and you can see the precision is fairly high for some of these. Uh, so to increase the precision, you run more chips, and that's what I did. And you can see that precision does decrease. Now, we weren't as concerned to get down to 2% or below 2% because they wanted to see more or less a ranking. So that this uh, gave them that information. You see that we did have some um, background with a no template. We also have this pew sample, which they'd always wondered about. Now, it, it's probably real unless they've got contamination from whatever they're working for in the lab. But, um, so I'm not going to say that that's a real number from their sample. But uh, they were very happy to see this uh, difference between their samples. They, it followed the trends they were seeing, but uh, this was a little more uh, concrete. Okay, so um, the other type of pathogen uh, were RNA viruses, and uh, what I want to say here is what, oops, go back. Um, we, we do a lot of uh, real-time PCR on samples uh, for viruses for people, and usually they give us a standard for those, uh, for those assays. Um, it's interesting, I noticed with the people bringing a polio virus, once two people from the same lab brought samples in, but their standard, even though it was supposed to be the same, was 60 to 80 fold different. So it was a little like disconcerting. They didn't seem to be too concerned about it, but um, you know, I don't know what their purpose was. So, so anyway, I thought this will be great. You know, I'll take their standards and figure out what's really going on. And so the, actually for the JCV virus, um, their standard was right on. Okay, so that, that was very nice. Uh, and I'll just say a word about the third one. Um, we're currently working on this with a um, graduate student who, um, uh, it's a brain, it's a virus that's in, uh, right now infecting the brain of the mice they're using. So it's going to be, all these are gonna be examples of me giving back to the researcher and saying, this is how we, what we can do with, for your research. You know, you can um, standardize your samples, but you can also see things that maybe hard to find. By the way, getting back to the polio virus, which um, was, you know, we were having problems with. Um, uh, okay, so the reason I put this up is because you don't really, so for digital PCR, it's, um, 
a log, a dynamic range of three to four logs. For real time, you're talking about eight logs. So you have to get your get your um, samples into a uh, narrow range, and so you could run all your samples here. These are different dilutions, and see which ones are in the um, uh, not overloading the, the chips because you want to be, you, it's 20,000 20, wells and you cannot overload it because you, you won't get good data. So um, what I've been trying to do is to hit a sweet spot a little sooner and if you've got an um, assay that's about 100% efficient then um, probably around 34, 35, 36 you can say you've got one copy. Uh, if it's 100% efficient then every 3.3 cycles it's a factor of 10. And if you like go down um, from the 30s and get in here, this is about the range that you want to work with. So you can start taking these samples and doing some dilutions of those or just throwing those on to get into the ballpark that you want to be. Um, okay, so this is with the uh, poliovirus and four different samples. The one you can see is overloaded, but that's okay because the other three are in the right, uh, in, a good, in a good amount. And again, this is uh, where you can review the data quality and look at the, um, see how many data points. And this one has a little less than 16,000. But with three chips here, you're going to get enough data to make a call. And actually, with this virus now, every time they bring it in, bring their standard in, we can run a couple chips and get the result we want. So then when they run the real-time PCR, they can plug in the exact number. OK, so. And this is the project dashboard. I kind of showed you this before. It'll also give you a graph showing how, for each sample, um, what, what they look like. And the one sample is overloaded, but the others are fairly close, and you can um, eliminate the one point and end up with the right amount. So instead of 1 times 10 to the ninth copies, their stuff is about 1 times 10 to the eighth, which is really very different. OK. so. My last slide, I just want to um, acknowledge certain people. Um, Ashley Price has been my tech for a long time, and she um, was trained on this, and she did a very fine job. We've got a new tech, Ginger, who's picked it up really quickly. For the ELM projects, Dr. Christina Rosa and Gary Mormon, uh, I think, you know, they've consented for me to use their materials and to uh, tell you about this today. And also for the polio virus, Sherry, Dr. Sherry Lee and Craig Cameron. I'd like to thank Marcia Slater for some technical support and then Lloyd and Dorothy Huck for funding of the Huck Institutes of Life Sciences. So, if you have any questions. <laughs>